I am a linguist. No, that doesn't mean that I speak 84 languages fluently or that I'm the most boring person in the world for liking this subject. I make it my job to look at all the little details, components, flaws, and irregularities of language that aren't appreciated enough. Now, to some of you, that will still seem like a pretty dull topic. What's the point of it, you might ask? Well, I believe that there's a hidden beauty to this field. And if you look hard enough and in all the right places, then it'll start to reveal its amazing self bit by bit. You see, I'm not only a linguist, but a conlanger as well. Now, most of you here probably won't know what that is. Put simply, conlanging is the application of linguistics used in simulating the construction and development of natural languages. The way I like to put it, linguistic fortune telling. One of the defining parts of conlanging is taking a pre-existing language and building on it, putting your own spin on it, speeding up the processes of change in a language from a few hundred years to a few days. Essentially, you're mapping out the potential future of a language with a bit of brain power. So what's the point of doing this? Well, conlanging is an incredibly powerful tool. It can make us look at language in a way that we've never done before. It can give us glimpses into what the future holds for language. Pretty exciting, right? So the only problem is, how do we go about doing this? Simple. When I conlang, I see three main parts to all this, the first of which is phonology. This part is all about the phonemes, the sounds in a language, and we'll also touch on orthography, the letters in a language. So basically, the first part of linguistic fortune telling is all about pronunciation and spelling. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that in order to see the future, we must first look at the past. So to see this all in action, we're taking a trip back in time, about 5,000 years or so. This is Proto-Indo-European, or PIE, the reconstructed ancestor of pretty much all of Europe's languages, including English. In my opinion, Proto-Indo-European is the best example of seeing the mechanics of how language changes over time. Take these words in PIE, for example. Podes and mer terre, respectively meaning feet and mother. Imagine calling your mother mer terre every time you eat her. Mer terre, I'm hungry. Mer terre, my shoes are too small. Mer terre, I'm tired. I mean, you could argue that we're lucky to have had these changes happen. These words, they're quite a bit more complicated than what we're used to. You've got guttural sounds, intonation, and vowel lengths all influencing the meaning of the word. Now let's take a look at the sound changes for each individual word. At first, it looks like a bunch of random shifts, but take a closer look, and you'll be able to identify two main trends here, the tendency to simplify and the tendency to shift to more sonorous sounds. The change from a p to a f, the small shifts in vowel sounds, and the loss of tone, length, and throat raising consonants are all examples of this. So by looking at our linguistic ancestor and analyzing one aspect of it, we found it to draw up two conclusions that we can use to make predictions when conlanging. And we can put that in practice. Now, let's say that for sound changes to happen, the human race will need to be subjected to a situation like our current one for quite a while. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but let's say that masks are enough of a nuisance to significantly affect our speech. People can't hear each other well because of these masks. So naturally, we're inclined to make our speech louder. And instead of shouting all the time, we change the pronunciation of words instead. So from feet, we could slowly edge towards words and sounds that are more sonorous. Fet, then fat. And then we get to fat. And voila, we've just conlanged. We've made logical linguistic predictions based on things we've seen happen to language before. The second part we can analyze is colloquialism. This looks at the impact of culture on language and vice versa. So here we're looking at 
things like idioms, metaphors, and all that nitty-gritty cultural stuff. The reference I'm starting out with here is a bit more distant than PIE. I'm taking the example of Klingon. Yep, that brilliantly raspy language from Star Trek, spoken by aliens with prosthetic foreheads. One of the things I love about Klingon is their word for hello. The thing is, they don't have one. The only thing close to a greeting is what do you want, and that's it. If my pop culture knowledge serves me well, then the Klingons are a race of cold-hearted space warriors, and this little feature of their language is supposed to reflect that. Instantly, we see just how much the fine details of a language can tell us about its speakers. It's a fine example of culture impacting a spoken tongue. Of course, we have examples of things like this closer to home. Uh, take the example of the phrase, steal someone's thunder, an idiom with a rather amusing origin. Now, again, we're going back in time, this time to the 1700s. Now, imagine this scene. John Dennis, a dramatist of the time, has just come up with an idea for a thunder machine to use in anonymous plays. The machine was brilliant. The play, less so, but he soon found his machine used in a performance of Macbeth, and soon everybody heard about how his thunder had been stolen. That phrase was used so much, it was such a big point of interest that eventually it found its way into everyday speech. Culture had again woven its way into our language. So we now know that for culture to have a considerable impact on language, there have to be events big enough to interest the speakers as a whole. Our current situation seems to check that box, right? So let's see. How do these circumstances manifest themselves in the form of language? Well, one of the biggest points of interest right now is making sure everything is hygienic. Are you clean? Are you sanitized? Do you have a cough? Already, we've seen a change happen. And if this goes on for long enough, then those phrases start to move up in our priority. And like the Klingons and their absence of hello, we could be greeting people with cleanest of blessings upon you. Again, this Conlanger's mindset lets us see the linguistic future, one which instantly reflects a core part of today's society. Now we come to the third and final part of linguistic fortune telling, manner of communication. This is an umbrella term for a rather broad part. Here we're looking at shifts in grammar, word meaning, as well as methods through which we communicate. Now, imagine this. Sometime in the future, we get a huge, and I mean huge, influx of people from non-English speaking countries moving to England. They don't speak English well. We don't speak their language well. So we have to compensate by communicating in a way that benefits everybody. The solution? Well, there's more than one. The first is a trend which we've talked about before, simplification. Although we as native speakers don't realize it, English is an incredibly difficult language. You teach today, but you taught yesterday, yet for some reason you didn't prawl if you preached in the past. Gnome is pronounced gnome, not ganomi. And rhythm has absolutely no vowels in it, yet we pronounce it like it does. Maddening. For all those people moving to England, this will be too much of a hassle for them. So naturally, they cut corners. They make things easier, more logical even. Because of the inconveniences, to put it mildly, that English poses to foreigners that need to learn it now, a little linguistic revolution happens. Now, that is what you do if you teach in the past. That is how we'll be spelling gnome instead. And that is what we're actually pronouncing rhythm like. Another phenomenon we could see happen is a semantic shift, a shift in the meaning of a word. Now, I've seen this happen myself at home. My parents are from Malaysia, and there are a few words that Malaysians have adopted from the English language, but have changed the meaning of slightly. One of these words is happening. Native English speakers will know that this is the present participle of the verb to happen. When we use it at home, though, it's an adjective we use to describe fun, hip things, situations, and whatnot. 
You could argue that this is a lot like slang. We take pre-existing words, change the meaning of them, then use them in casual situations. Could this happen in the future? Of course. Again, let's get back into our Conlangs mindset and randomly pick a word that we've heard quite a lot recently, maybe lockdown. Right now, it means a state of isolation for safety or security. As time goes on, we'll start to use that word more and more often, and with that increase in use comes a widening of its meaning. So maybe in the course of a few years, we'll find that lockdown is not just a state of isolation, but a boring event that drains happiness. Seems pretty accurate, right? There's one more shift that we haven't encountered before. Spoken language to sign language. Now it's time for a little bit more exaggeration. Again, I'm taking the example of thick masks. Apart from speech, hand gestures are a crucial part of human communication. It's harder to hear speech. Naturally, our gestures could become more pronounced, more noticeable. We could start to associate specific gestures with specific words. Then our range of gestures could grow. We could put them in certain orders, we build more and more sentences, and soon we might have no need whatsoever for spoken language. This is exactly how natural sign language develops. If we're exposed to the right conditions, so to speak, we could very well follow in the footsteps of signers. So, three parts. Three ways in which we could approach conlanging, our little linguistic portion time. Phonology, colloquialism, and manner of communication. This isn't just the result of some 14-year-old boy rambling on about some niche topic. This is proof of just how fascinating it can be to peer into the future of language. It's proof of just how much language can say about us. It's proof of just how much power we have over the way we speak. And it's proof of just how rapidly language is developing. Sure, you could argue that conlanging is just a daydream of what could be, but how could you deny the tantalizing glimpses of the linguistic possibilities that it offers? Tell me, can you imagine calling these your fart? Greeting your friends by wishing them a clean, sanitized day? Writing English in a heavily simplified way like this? Or even signing to your friends that Language has the potential to change every single time someone opens their mouth. It's up to us as speakers to drive that potential forward. With the help of that little tool called conlanging, you've all seen the future in the past 10 or so minutes. Now it's time to speak it. Thank you for listening.